Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who has joined us today. My name is Amy Batson, and I'm the Executive Director of Women Lift Health. Thank you so much for joining us for our fourth virtual speaker series event, where we'll hear from three fantastic women on why now is the time to elevate the voices of nurses in the COVID-19 response and beyond. This is part of a series where we're analyzing the power and gender dynamics at play in health emergencies, speaking with leaders from across the health and development sectors. Please visit our website for recordings of the previous events. Some of you may know Women Lift Health, but for those that don't, we're an initiative to advance women's leadership in health through concrete action at the individual, institutional, and societal levels. We believe fundamentally that global health challenges will not be solved without greater diversity, most notably women, at the decision-making tables. I invite attendees to visit the website and follow us on social media for more information on our specific efforts, including the ways in which we're partnering with organizations and leaders around the world to support the advancement of talented women leaders. And so today's topic, why now is the time to elevate the voices of nurses. For many tuned in, I don't need to stress how vital nurses are to the health system, but let me state a few things we know. Nurses are the first and main provider for patients in times of crisis like today and in calm. They provide 80% of primary health care worldwide. They ensure patients are healthy, comfortable, and safe. They advocate for the patient's needs and they play a critical role communicating with doctors and families. But despite their life-saving work, there is a stark gap between the value of what nurses do and the recognition they receive. Nurses face long hours, low pay, and few opportunities to sit at the decision-making tables in the global health field. And COVID-19 has only aggravated these inequalities. At least 90,000 healthcare workers have been infected with the virus thus far. And nurses are at a higher risk of exposure because they're in closer contact with the patients. Worldwide, nurses have encountered a deluge of scared and sick patients while confronting significant PPE shortages and unprepared hospital systems. So many have risked their own mental and physical health for the well being of their communities, and some have lost their lives for it. Like many others on the front line, the vast majority of the world's nurses are women. And the treatment of nurses during this pandemic reminds us that in our societies, jobs deemed as quote unquote women's work are far too often undervalued. Now is a critical moment to highlight how essential nurses are to a well-functioning, resilient health system. But it's not just about highlighting their importance. We must also call for action, for greater investment in and more opportunities for nurses in health leadership. When the world geared up to celebrate the year of the nurse and midwife, none could have predicted the critical role nurses would be playing in all of our lives today. Now, more than ever, as nurses' lives are on the line, we must deliver back to them. Before introducing our speakers, just a few housekeeping items. Please do send us your questions via the chat line. I'll be posing them to our speakers during the Q&A session at the end of this. The session will also be recorded and made available on our website and social media. And finally, if you don't already, please follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Women Lift Health, and feel free to tag us with more questions or comments about today's event. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our speakers today. I'm delighted to have with us Annette Kennedy, President of the International Council of Nurses. Annette is a registered nurse and midwife and previously held the position of the President of the European Federation of Nurses. Annette, thank you so much for joining us. I'm delighted to have Rose Clark Nanyonga, who is the Vice Chancellor of Clark International University. 
Rose holds a PhD in nursing and her research explores issues related to health system strengthening in low and middle income countries and nursing leadership in Uganda. Rose, thank you so much for joining. And I'm delighted to have Sarah Walji, who is a registered nurse with Halston Healthcare and is currently serving as an inpatient mental health nurse on the front lines in Canada. She's also a Nursing Now Young Nurse Representative. Sarah, thank you for joining us. So thank you to all of you for being with us here today and taking your time to share uh, your insights on this critical topic. To kick it off, we'd love to just set the stage a little bit about what it means to be a nurse and what's actually happening um, on the front lines. So Annette, if I could begin with you, nurses have always been critical to our healthcare system. And today they're more important than ever. So can you help us understand what does it look like to, to be a nurse? Thank you, Amy. And thank you for that introduction and for the overview. It's a very different um, plateau now for nurses. When we started out for this year, 2020, we had planned a year, of course, that was designated by the World Health Organization as the year of the nurse and the midwife. It was also the bicentenary of Florence Nightingale. And we had planned to showcase nursing. We had planned to profile, to increase the profile of nurses. And of course, we had planned to celebrate. But COVID-19 changed all that. It changed in such a way that it put nurses to the forefront of this pandemic. And what we see now is a very different role for nurses in a way. The role of caring for patients is the same, but in a very different method. Nurses always in, had a role in which they were close to the patients. They spent a lot of time with the patients. They knew the patient, they knew the family, they knew the community, they knew all about the patient. They had a very different role to every other professional. And it was important that they knew the worries and the concerns of the patient. But now that's very different when they don all this gear that makes them look like an astronaut, as some of the patients have said, and it's very difficult to work in it. And they also have had issues in actually finding appropriate PPE that fit them. And of course, they work long hours. They work, as you said, 14 hours. They work over 14 day period a lot of the times. And they have witnessed very many deaths and very many seriously ill patients, which is unusual in itself on a constant basis. They're also worried about taking the virus home to their families. And they also have to make heartbreaking decisions about um, perhaps leaving their family and going elsewhere in order to protect them. And they have faced stigma. They have faced a lot of stigma because of misunderstanding, of disinformation and of ignorance. So people are, see them as threats that they may get the virus from them. What they don't understand is that nurses are so busy worrying about their own families that they're going to be more careful than anybody else. But I would like to, if with my may, we had a letter from a, lady, a nurse in Italy who at the height of the pandemic in Italy was working on the front line in intensive care and she was actually managing intensive care. And she wrote um, a letter to us. I cannot describe it as well as she did. And I'm only going to take excerpts from her letter. So what she says is, our lives completely changed one month ago. People now call us heroes. But despite our continuous struggles, we were not recognized until a month ago. Did we need a virus to make people and institutions understand that we are the spine of the health service? Our lives now engaged in COVID ICU. The wards are like continuous roller coaster rides, fatigue and anger, then sedated by the first successes on patients that you can finally transfer from the intensive care unit and with who, despite the short time, the protective clothing that barely allows us to breathe, find time to talk and communicate with them to make them feel not alone. We are the only company they have and it is impossible to smile with a mask but we learn to talk and smile with our eyes. But the reality still slams you in the face. The system is not protecting us. And going out from the COVID area, we have to fight for COVID testing. We have to fight for proper PPE and we have to fight for adequate staffing level. And the signs that are on our faces are the only evident part of the scars we have inside for being worried to be not enough, 
or to be too tired to give the best assistance to our patients, to come back home and perhaps infect our families. Our attitude is to think and to care of people and we are doing this the best we can. But the real problem will be when at the end of this tragedy, we as nurses will find ourselves in front of a mirror, exhausted, unarmed, unable to order, but order to our thoughts and feelings caused by the emotional shock and the physical stress due to this period. Maybe we'll fill pages of testimonials and interviews. Everybody will keep calling us heroes. And maybe these same heroes just need to be considered and treated as the professionals they are. Everybody is talking about our sacrifice, but the point is we are doing the same things we did with the same competencies and dedication until last month, with sacrifice and in difficult conditions, but the same things. We are the same nurses we were until the beginning of February. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Says it all. That does say it all. Sarah, so I'm sure that what Annette just read aloud from this Italian colleague um, has deeply resonated with you. Could you also share with us how your life has changed in COVID-19 and walk us through what a, a typical day is like for you? Um, Sarah, I think you might be muted. Oh, there sorry, you. there we go. I was just about to say, honestly, the letter, it it hits it right on the head. It's, it's something I think everybody's felt across the board. You're feeling that fear, that uncertainty, that, that now people are recognizing you for things that you've always done and labeling it as heroic acts when in actuality it's your day-to-day -day routine and it's not really the recognition that you're looking for. It's more so the support of the systems in place that you're looking for and advocating for at this rate. Um, but that being said, a day-to-day -day has completely changed for me. I work in a psych environment. I do mental health nursing. I'm not the type of nurse that dons and doffs PPE on a regular basis, usually, um, unless there's some type of precaution or need for it, which there is very, very rarely, if at all. And now you're seeing us in complete gear where we go into our patient rooms. We're masked up. We've got face shields on. You can't have the same level of interaction with your patients as you previously did. And being in a mental health environment, that's quite difficult because communication is really one of our biggest things that we've got. Um, so when we go in, you run an assessment. You're not doing these long, in-depth assessments with your patients anymore. You're not taking that time because you simply don't have it. Staffing is short. Um, you're constantly overrun. You're dealing with a lot of mental health-based concerns with this pandemic, as well as just the resource limitations with the system that's been limited as is and now is completely showing its true colors to everybody that's involved with it. And you're also dealing with that fear, right? Like, what if you bring it home? What if you take it back to your families? I know a number of my younger colleagues have been very, very fearful being on the front lines in terms of what if we're accidentally exposed? What if we do bring it home? We infect our entire families. And then what happens then? How do we how do we manage that? How do we deal with that on our consciences as well? And so it's it's been different. It's been different. I find myself running 12 hours in a mask. Um, I'm not eating with my colleagues anymore. I'm going into a little room, if at all, maybe once a shift to have a meal for a quick 10 to 15 minutes if I can. I'm being really, really careful in terms of how much I consume through my shift. It's like, it's not been as easy as it was previously where I could have a glass of water open on the table and sip from it as needed. Now I find myself dehydrated at the end of my shifts oftentimes because you have your mask on and every time you want to take a drink, you want to step out of the room so that you're not, you're not in an environment that's potentially put, putting you at risk. And it's just being mindful of that, um, wiping down literally everything. The moment I leave the hospital, I got to leave my shoes in the car, got to make sure that I change my scrubs. It's stuff like that. The things that I never thought I would have to do, we're now having to do. And it's, it's completely turned routine upside down. It takes a 12-hour shift and turns it into 14 hours because of that. 
because of the additional steps that you're now taking before and after your shift where you're doffing all your PPE, you're making sure that you're not cross-contaminating anything that you've worn out of the hospital into your home environment. You're coming home, you're, you're literally taking that hot shower and thinking, okay, I hope this is enough. I hope this is enough. And it's just, again, it's, it's something that I didn't think I would ever deal with, especially this early into my nursing career. And being somebody that's, that's just hit 25, I didn't think that something like this would ever, ever hit us to this level. And it's, it's different, and it's new, and we're constantly readjusting. And it's, it's uncertainty that's surrounding us, quite frankly, and it's there and it's present. Yeah. So Rose, um, so we're hearing also there's, it's not only the nurses at the front lines caring for the COVID patients, it's the nurses at the front lines caring for the non-COVID patients, but facing many of the same kind of risks and precautions and, and challenges um, as they face the uncertainties for themselves and their patients. How have nurses in Uganda been impacted by the, this, this ripple effect that's from the pandemic? Rose? Um, thank you, Ami. Um, I think that, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Ah, thank you very much, sorry. Um, I think that the uh, experiences, you know, seem to be similar. Um, we don't have, um, our numbers in terms of uh, COVID positive patients, uh, they are steadily rising, but they have not been at the same level as what has been experienced in, in other countries. Um, however, the concern, uh, the fear, the level of preparedness for healthcare workers um, is, is exactly the same. And um, the government of Uganda was really swift in implementing uh, some public health measures um, that had all of us, you know, stay home uh, where we have been for the last 60 or, or so days. But of course, nurses and midwives are essential workers that have to continue going to work. So one of the things that was implemented here was uh, the stopping public transportation. Um, and that meant that nurses in the initial enforcement of this public health measure, a majority of nurses had to commute uh, to their work places um, because many of them don't have um, their own private vehicles and they rely largely on the public transportation to be able to get to work. The second public uh, health measure that was implemented was the curfew, um, which meant that, you know, nurses that are working 12 hour shifts uh, seven o'clock still uh, found them somewhere either still at the work setting or somewhere in between their home. And we had an enforcement um, group that didn't actually understand that uh, very well, uh, at least initially. Uh, and so nurses were not only afraid of losing their jobs, getting to work on time, but they were also really afraid of their own safety, having to encounter the enforcement crews uh, on the way home, having to wake up so early in the morning. Um, we uh, have been conducting a survey of the nurses and midwives across the country to see how they have been impacted by this. And some of the stories, that we've been getting uh, nurses uh, on canoes having to get to work using whatever means they have, um, nurses having to walk, nurses having to, you know, use bicycles, you know, essentially, while the rest of us who are not at the front line uh, were staying home, every nurse and midwives was, who was scheduled to go to work had to find their own way to get there. One of the things that has been surprising uh, for us is not only are they harmonizing and strengthening the COVID response across the health sector, as we know they are uh, both in terms of prevention, educating the community, as well as treating and controlling, but we also have had such a collective response in terms of nurses actually coming together and supporting each other. 
we have a connected network of more than 3,000 nurses and we, we really haven't seen uh, this kind of response before. So any nurse who has access to a phone who has access to WhatsApp is somehow in some kind of a WhatsApp group. And these communities of practice have been instrumental in really getting nurses to talk to each other, first of all, uh, talk about the issues that impact them, but also I identifying where need is and how we can get that need there. One of the things that was uh, a result of that coming together is uh, the uh, nuns and midwives leaders think tank uh, that was formed early in April, drawing from uh, multiple leaders uh, across the sector, um, including education, Ministry of Health, um, uh, Ministry of Education and Sports, uh, leaders from the associations, um, senior nursing and principal nursing officers from regional referral hospitals. And that think tank was instrumental in harnessing voice and amplifying that voice and being able to table what are the critical issues. And uh, some of those issues included what Annette uh, and Sarah are already talking about. One, inclusion of nurses in decision-making, in operational strategy, um, to be able to actually <laughs> lobby for, for nurses. And most of the time, it, this is really a, 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 an interesting uh, and a phenomena and also a puzzle um, that for many, many, many years, uh, we have talked about how critical nurses and midwives are to the healthcare system. We know that they are largely responsible for majority of the health system outcomes, nearly 80% um, of those outcomes, um, it, you know, they are responsible for all of that. So we know, and yet it seems that such a simple issue, uh, the public doesn't seem to understand it. And a majority of those uh, in policy uh, and in decision-making uh, seem to actually miss that critical point. And when you are in a pandemic such as this, and you are formulating um, national task forces and subcommittees, knowing that nurses are the majority, and as my colleague said, really the spine of the healthcare system, it would make sense that you would include them in that discussion and in that dialogue, because they know what really impacts nurses um, are in practice. But actually that's not necessarily true. So one of the purposes of the think tank is to be able to lobby for that inclusion, uh, to be able to lobby for nurses in, within the subcommittees, you know, are they there? But the other critical issue that came out of our research uh, was that more than 81% of the nurses and midwives we were talking to didn't have access to PPE. Now we know that there is a global scarcity of course, but that makes it quite difficult for nurses to actually go out every single day when they are worried about their own safety. And then as you rightly mentioned, they have to worry about the safety of their families if they are going back to those families every single day, not knowing if they have come in contact with somebody who is positive. And also more than 90% of them, even though they continue to go to care uh, facilities every day, had never been tested for, for COVID. Uh, so that was an issue. And then the other issue has been compensation, that, that finally uh, we are now talking, you know, all the work that they are having to do, not only compensation, risk compensation and so on. And then finally, the logistics and resources, again, making transport available. There was a bit of a delay to actually get that done. And when it happened, only those within the urban centers were able to get the privilege of that transport. Nurses working in rural healthcare centers didn't have the same privilege. So there is need to be able to uh, galvanize all of those efforts to enable nurses to, to do what we expect them to do, uh, which is uh, look after patients every single day. So thank you. Uh, but we, we've been pleasant with what is happening in Uganda. 
So I think we've heard, I want to move into a little bit more even in depth on what Rose has started, what every, all three speakers have highlighted, which is the real challenges. Um, it's, I think what we're seeing is kind of this extraordinary picture of um, COVID-19 has exacerbated the challenges. It's put on top of what nurses have done every day, a whole series of extra issues associated with the st short staffing, the the fear of being with their own family and possibly being a route of transmission, the uncertainties attached to anything, and then the physical constraints of just even getting to getting to work, um, managing all of the uh, the PPE equipment or not having the PPE equipment. Um, and I think one thing to, to highlight is what Annette started with, which is women are, nurses are being called heroes now. Um, and yet what, this, what nurses are doing is the same thing they've been doing day after day, year after year before COVID-19. And suddenly there's a little bit more recognition. It doesn't sound like there's nearly as much recognition as it should be due. Um, but I think it's that critical issue that we really need to be digging into. So, dig, so looking more at these challenges, Sarah, um, I'd love you to, to share a little bit more about, you know, are you seeing kind of some, some of the, some biases? Uh, as a young nurse, um, and particularly for female nurses that kind of are being regularly confronted? Sarah, you're muted again. Keep forgetting about that, sorry. <laughs> but I was just I was just saying, as we know, there's a huge gap with women at the leadership level within the sphere of global health, and that's been an ongoing issue. And I think that's only been further exasperated and highlighted by this whole COVID crisis, because we're looking at women being in nursing and women making up the vast majority of nursing as a profession on a holistic level, but yet not entering into that leadership level, leadership not being listened to from a female perspective or from a women's point of view. And that um, that plays into the into the really big issue surrounding, oh, okay, what does women's leadership look like? How able are we to enter into these realms of leadership without a crisis, let alone when a crisis is in place? And then in addition to that, I'm also finding it interesting from a younger nurse perspective because I'm considered a youth. So how does that play into things as well, where we're not listening to youth as much anymore because we're listening to experts and we're limiting the expert pool to people who have been very much versed in previously in previous experiences surrounding um, SARS, for instance, when I was only just a kid, I wasn't even considering nursing when SARS had happened. I'd barely even known what SARS was. Um, but we're not listening to that narrative from a younger perspective because we're saying, oh, okay, let's listen to experts. Let's listen to people with experiences. And it's all good and great that we're listening to those ex those quote unquote experts and those individuals with experiences. But a lot of the youth are facing the same issues and we're facing the same level of concerns and we're bringing the same attention to things that somebody who's got 20 years seniority to me has brought up. And a lot of us are very passionate about it as well. We've engaged within our youth circles, we've engaged in interdisciplinary dialogue, and there's a lot of innovative activities happening surrounding that. So I think that's important to highlight is that there's already a gender bias in place, but there's also a bit of an age bias in place as well, relating back to experiences. Amy, you're still muted. Am I unmuted now? Thank you. Um, so Rose, so we do know 60% of the health workforce is, is made up of nurses. Um, and yet only 10% of the leadership role um, is, is made of nurses. Um, and you started to highlight an, an interesting inclusion, sort of a lobbying for inclusion. Um, can you talk more about what are the, the barriers? I know uh, Sarah just mentioned a few, but like the barriers to leadership that nurses face. And, and even tell us a little bit about your own story to getting to be a leader. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, uh, Amy. Uh, my own story, that, that's a long story. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll start with inclusion, but I think that um, the issue of inclusion, uh, people hear it differently um, because there is inclusion of uh, somebody who happens to be there and you sort of tick the box. Um, but 
that's really different from inclusion and engagement. Um, do we have the capacity, do we have the leadership capacity of nurses who are, if they have an opportunity to be at the table, can actually fully engage the policy makers um, and lobby for other nurses and midwives. So I think that one of our uh, limitations or barriers is the level of skill set um, and the inclusion of leadership and management as a strong, strong discipline within the nursing and midwifery curricula at all levels, um, it, you know, starting from the enrolled nurse, uh, the diploma holder nurse, the bachelor degree prepared nurse, the master's degree, and so on. I think that we need to be able to prioritize that. That is still really an important key because when you graduate a, say, a cohort of nurses, um, there is an expectation that they have a certain skill set uh, and mindset and the capacity to transform working environments and to be able to lead uh, other nurses. Um, so that's really important. But I, I want also to talk about some of the traditional norms um, that traditionally nurses have always been uh, women we do um, within the traditionally been female there is uh, therefore a certain um expectation that comes with uh, that social norm um, the expectation of what is a female like and what is a female supposed to do um, in you know, look after the home, which is an important role, of course, you know, cook, have children, and so on and so forth. And there is also a difference of their own power to somebody else. Um, about five years ago, I was invited to speak to a group of nurses and nursing leaders. And one of the things that I really challenged was that there is this expectation and it's a barrier among us. There is the expectation that the solutions are going to come from the thing. If you have 60% of your providers, uh, are nurses and midwives, but you are not expecting solutions, practical, pragmatic solutions from that workforce, then it has to come from somewhere else. So I think that nurses needed to be able to learn to challenge upward uh, beyond the traditional expectations. Um, sometimes being aggressive is often viewed as a negative thing, even though we teach nurses and midwives to be assertive. So I think that in practice, there is a challenge knowing how to be assertive without being aggressive, which is actually perceived um, as something really negative. A culture of curiosity and continuous learning really demands minds and nurses that can ask questions without fear of consequences. So nurses have to be able to overcome that fear that there are consequences for them to be able to speak up. And then finally, the historically, nursing philosophy in Uganda really is underpinned by this idea of Florence Nightingale being a wonderful woman, you know, um, perfect. Um, and I think that there is a, a disconnect here between the older um, announcing leaders and the young blazing leaders uh, such as Sarah, who uh, possibly look at Florence Nightingale as a rebel, somebody who transformed things, somebody who was innovative, somebody who used the data for decision making, somebody who challenged the traditional norms and challenged her family uh, to be what she wanted to be. Um, but I think that most of the time, the, the older generation perceive Florence to be something 
of an angel, perhaps, <laughs> a saint, perhaps. And that barrier, <laughs> we need to be able to, to overcome, I think. Thank you, Rose. Um, so um, so uh, just a reminder to our audience, please do send in questions. We'll be getting to those um, shortly. Uh, and Annette, um, so Sarah and Rose have, have painted a tough picture on getting the voices of women of nurse leaders out there. Um, and yet we know there's a huge shortage of nurses per being predicted over the next decade. I know in the US it's something like 1.5 million, um, a shortfall of 1.5 million nurses over the next decade. And that holds true in almost every country. How do we, you know, let's start thinking about the solutions here. How do we, how do we attract, continue to attract these talented uh, people, particularly women, to nursing under the kind of conditions um, that they're they're exposed to. Yeah. Um, yes, it's a, a tough question. Um, we and I follow up on what Rose and what Sarah said, and I think that there's a lot of work to be done in all of that area of leadership and linking the young nurses who have enthusiasm, who have new ideas with the experience of the older nurses. I think you need both, but we need to have to work together. I think also that nurses um, per se are not the best at talking about what they do. I think we have to take a little bit of ownership for that. I think this the other area is that um, what because we are 80% um, female, uh, it's synonymous with the woman. It's synonymous with gender. And you know, it, it's synonymous with the caring um, role of women. And as you know, the caring role of women, of children, of house, of older people and everything else like that is not considered um, worthy of salary. It's not considered worthy of being included in GDP. It's not included. It's kind of um, invisible and it's not given any credit. So unless you uh, have the two of those together in some shape or form. So you have to look at women on the one side and say, okay, um, do we value this or do we not? Because it's kind of linked to what nurses do because we're seen as carers. We do a lot more than that, but it's seen in the caring arena. When the um, World Health Organization and ICN and Nursing Now um, reported with um, a publication on World Health Day on 191 countries reported back on the state of the world's nursing. And that gives us um, a template. It gives us um, a framework to go forward with. There's a lot of recommendations that are in that about the shortage of 6 million nurses, about how we retain and how we recruit nurses how we invest in education, how we invest in leadership, how we invest in pay and conditions, how we invest in allowing nurses to work to their full competence. Because we have nurses now that are, can work as advanced nurse practitioners, as nurse specialists, we can, and they can work in every area um, across the health sector. I think sometimes um, people do not really understand what nurses do. And you're asking about bringing nurses into the profession. And if I wasn't in the profession, I wouldn't realize um, the variety um, of the roles that nurses can do right across the spectrum from birth to death, um, community to hospital, to hospice care, from children to adults, to mental health, to um, learning disability. There is a range, there is, you know, everybody could find uh, an area of work that will suit them. That's for sure. It's varied. And it's exciting. You have to enjoy it, that's for sure. But it's it's never dull. It, and it's challenging and it's responsible. And I think what we would like more is equality in relation to um, the division of labor and the division of labor, which we are able to do. You, you cannot put um, the different professionals into silos anymore. It's um, whoever is the right person in the right place at the right time should give the care. And if you look across the world, what you will see in a lot of countries is that nurses are giving all the care in some areas. There is nobody else except a nurse that will see a, a, um, a patient or a community or a family at various times. So I think that 
we have to um, ensure that nurses get a good salary, that they have good conditions of employment, that there is investment in the health service, because if they don't invest in the health service, they will not have healthcare. If they don't invest in nurses, if, if you are to withdraw nurses in the morning from theater, if you are to withdraw them from accident emergency or from intensive care or from mental health, there's no health service. There is no health service. So we have to um, talk about that. And I don't think we're good at doing that. And I was asked at one time by a journalist, you know, why is it, and this is no disrespect to any profession, why is it that when medical profession ask for salary increase or support or um, more in the workforce, more of a medical profession, um, that they usually um, get a positive answer. And when nurses ask, they're ignored. And, you know, you think about the different things and you think about them, the fact that you're gender and that, you know, you're advocates and that you don't think about, you know, yourself so much as a patient. But it's, it's not that. It's the fact that people don't recognize that we save lives every day. Just equally the way that doctors save lives. If I go into hospital, I want a competent doctor. I absolutely do. And there's so many of them out there that, that are great. But I want a competent nurse too. Because if the nurse isn't quick enough to recognize that I need an intervention, then I am in trouble and I may die. And nurses are doing that every day of the week. So I think that we ourselves have a challenge about coming out there and saying, you know, what we do in nursing, how important we are, and that we should be at the table, at every table, you know, no matter what it is. But we have to take the initiative to go to the table. So I think we've heard some amazing insights here um, that, you know, uh, some of the real challenges and also some of the solutions that nurses are not recognized that are as saving lives every day, just like doctors. And there's a problem. There is a problem that because nursing is, is um, predominantly women and, it's, and women's work is often discounted, we have this challenge of nurses being a bit invisible being taken for granted is what I'm, I'm hearing, that the sort of extraordinary work and challenges and jobs that nurses do every single day is something that's largely taken for granted. Um, we have the social norms um, that Rose uh, mentioned. When uh, a woman is assertive, when a nurse is assertive, it's often perceived as aggressive. She may not actually be being aggressive, um, but there is a perception of how women are expected to behave in certain societies, how they're expected to act, um, the kind of jobs they're supposed to do, uh, and that that's, that is one of the very big challenges that, that nurses also face. And then of course, some of these critical issues that have been raised around the skill sets and making sure there's some additional skill sets going on to be leaders, to be managers. And I think to Annette's point, to be communicators, um, able to articulate what is the role, what is the, the, the critical backbone as I think the quote was, nurses are the spine of the health, uh, of the health system uh, and being able to communicate it. And being able to be at those um, leadership tables as, as Sarah has, has highlighted. Um, I wanna to go to questions now and just the, the audience questions because we have quite a number of them coming in. Um, I would just say that, you know, we, we've heard it over and over and over again. Nurses are the backbone. Nurses are the spine of the health system. And it's great that this year they've been spotlighted, right? That it's been spotlighted for their dedication, their resilience and their sacrifice. And we're hearing they're heroes in COVID-19, but actually they're heroes every day. And that's what we need to start recognizing. So now let me, let me just jump now to some of the audience questions that have come in. Um, first question here is, uh, I'm not sure, maybe either Annette or Sarah, uh, can you speak on the mental health toll to nurses of their work every day during this pandemic and other crises? What are some of the initiatives to help address that mental health pressure on the nurses themselves. So Annette, you can you can take it if you want, or I can take it and then you can swing in. Yeah, sure, sure, I will. Um, yes, we have been hearing um, from nurses all over the world about the stress, um, both physical and mental, on nurses. It is a it's a very different, um, I suppose nursing arena it's a very we, we have never been um in this 
state before. We've never faced a pandemic before. So it's new to everyone. And it's new to the nurses that particularly on the front line. And we have heard, you know, they're seeing their colleagues being sick. They're seeing their colleagues die actually. And quite a number of nurses have died. Uh, quite a number of nurses have committed suicide. So it is very serious. And so what we have been asking for is for nurses to have counseling, to have support, to have rest breaks, to ensure that there is somebody that they can go to, it, you know, because they cannot keep running a 12 or 14 hour shift without, you know, having um, breaks, without having support, without being able to go to a counseling service and that that be provided for them. That is, is, and that it's not just now because a lot of this will come up way after the epidemic or the pandemic has gone. It will come up much, much later when they have time to reflect, and when they have time to um, think about what actually happened when they were so busy to do nothing else except to treat patients. So we really have to look after and protect our nurses. We really have to protect them th from the violence and abuse that they are, that's been uh, perpetrated on them. That's absolutely not right. And I expect governments to do something and to come in and not to, to not condone what is happening. I expect them to support nurses with PPEs. Why should they be worried about protective clothing? Why should they be worried about being tested? They should, that's not, you know, there's enough stresses with the patients and with the way they have to deliver care. Besides worrying about the actual needs, if they were going to fire, you would automatically give them the equipment that they need. Well, they are, they're going into a virus that may kill them or may kill the patients. So they need, they don't need to be going out looking for it. So yes, I, I am very concerned about the nurses. And I have to say ICN has been working right across with all our nursing associations and lobbying with WHO, with the UN, with, with our other colleagues in medicine and in pharmacy and in all of the other areas for governments to come out and support nurses. Um, a question on some of the education tracks that uh, that Annette you mentioned and, and Rose uh, and Sarah, you all have been calling up sort of some of the skill sets, um, but many of them are not available in lower or middle income countries. And the question is, how do we overcome the authority obedience that is inculcated into nurses and instead motivate uh, them into expanding their capacity by engaging in additional education, additional research? Rose, do you want to address that? You're muted, Rose. Sorry. Um, I think that part of what en enables um, transformation in um, the education sector um, is actually the regulatory uh, framework and, and tools that, that exist, that those two things um, have to go hand in hand um, to be able to open um, what has been ring-fenced previously, where nurses, you know, could only study A, B, C, and D, um, and they don't have as many opportunities for advancement. But the other critical issue is actually what Annette talked about, um, which it underpins the current uh, WHO uh, state of the world nursing report is to invest um, in the education of nurses to allow the majority of nurses that we have um, at low level certificate level, for example, to have opportunities to upgrade. So a great deal of investment in um, their scholarship and their education has to be prioritized. And it's a big ask to the government to prioritize this at na in national budgets and in budgets of other organizations that are embedded within the, the health sector. Um, and until that happens, um, because the salary of nurses, it continues to be significantly lower than where it needs to be, majority are not able to afford to advance their education um, it, when they want to go for postgraduate programs. And universities are becoming you know, more and more expensive, uh, including public entities, uh, whether it's private or, 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 or public. And so for us to be able to deliver a level of education 
that brings the capacity of nurses and midwives to where we want them to be um, in taking on leadership positions, they need to be able to access that education. But I think that structures need to also be more responsive to what is currently happening. And we need to start asking this question. What kind of nurse and midwife do we need right now in every country? And what kind of nurse and midwife do we need? It means that it flips the growing board and begin to ask, okay, what skill set now do they need in terms of mindset, culture, in terms of skill set, and in terms of tool set? How do we enable them to be able to speak to the current situation so that we're not training a nurse leader who could respond to you know, 30 years ago um, context, but they are actually not able to respond to a fast past uh, uh, changing world, fast past changing world that they work in. So I think that's really, really important. Thank you. Sarah, so I wanna check in with you both on this, this question as sort of a youth leader in the nursing field, if you see um, ways to help ensure or to help support nurses to be, um, be confident to step up, to be using their leadership skills and using their voice. Uh, and then also on that mental health question, which I know you're, you're directly on the front lines of that. Uh, so I'll just speak to the mental health piece first and then I guess dip into the youth component of that. Um, so Annette really summarized a lot of the key issues and key asks. Uh, especially from the ICN standpoint and with the work with the WHO and the UN. There has been instances that I've heard, again, of the suicides amongst healthcare practitioners, the suicides of nurses in Italy. Uh, that was really shocking for me. I read the article that came out about it, and it was, it was something that put it into perspective because I didn't realize how much of an impact it was really playing into the minds of frontliners till I actually went back to work and dealt with a lot of the issues myself. Um, you're having this fear and this uncertainty and it's playing into a lot of causes of, or a lot of causes of concern and a lot of anxious thoughts and a lot of um, depressive episodes for people. It's putting you in this really low mentality, especially if you don't have the right supports in place. So really advocating for that support has been a huge thing. I know that there's a lot of um, community-based resources that have now come about, digital resources, hospital-based resources, where they're looking at mental health for workers. They're looking at mental health for people who are dealing with COVID firsthand. And it's important because we could be looking at a whole generation that's dealing with PTSD from this and dealing with a lot that they're going to have to go through in the next couple of years to really get back into what they will call normal. So support through this whole process is vital and it's really, really important that we're advocating for that and that we're creating that system that really allows for it to be implemented on the front lines globally. And bringing in the youth piece, Rose, I really like how you highlighted the need for educational investment and in the you as well. And it's looking at this idea that a lot of our interdisciplinary colleagues might have more opportunities to advocate and really come about in this advocacy role because they have the right skills to do so. Nurses, unfortunately, a lot of them lack the articulateness and the articulacy to really advocate for key asks and to put it into summary in terms of what we're trying to say within a short snippet of time, especially to a media outlet or to even feel confident enough to go to that outlet. I've spoken with frontline nurses who have been frontline nurses for years and years and years, 30 years, 20 years, 15 years. They're amazing at what they do, but they don't have the ability to speak to their, their self-worth and their self-merits because they haven't been given those skills on how to present to this type of, this type of audience in this certain environment. So you're looking at nurses with experience and with these lived lived stories and memoirs that are very valuable, especially in this time and could really move a conversation forward, but they haven't been given the set on how to present. They haven't been given this 
the skill in terms of how to speak in one to two minutes on a point that they're really passionate about. And it's looking at that need for investment as Rose, as Rose highlighted within education. So how are we expanding our educational um, curricula, our educational supports to support younger nurses or nurses going through school right now so that they are able to articulate to this so that they do build that confidence so that they know that they're not just a frontline worker and that that's maybe one of the only roles for them as a nurse. No, they can be policymakers. They can be at the leadership level. They should be advocating for all that. And they're very much vital in terms of the system moving forward and us learning from coronavirus and us going forward after this pandemic, they are vital within that process of sustainable change. Yeah. So one of the, our audience noted that in India, there isn't an independent council of nursing research um, or a separate directorate for nurses in India. And they noted on paper, nursing is an independent profession, but in reality, they're positing it's not. They ask, how do we turn doctors into allies rather than those who are dominating, those who dominate the decision-making ability of women nurses or of nurses generally? Annette? Um, I think that we have some allies in medicine already, but I think that it's gender issue too, because if you watch, you will find that it's mainly male um, doctors that are involved in a lot of the strategic policy and in a lot of the decision making and not their uh, female colleagues. So I don't think it's particularly um, doctors, nurses per se, because I do think that, you know, we have some advocates. I'm not saying that we have a lot of advocates. I'm saying that we build on the advocates that we have and that works very well. But I think that we have to take um, a lot of things into our own hands. And I, I do think um, what we're missing certainly in across the world. We lobbied a long time for a chief nurse at the World Health Organization. We are now lobbying for a chief nurse in every region. We have to have a chief nurse at in every country, but not a chief nurse in name only, because a chief nurse in name only is of no value. The chief nurse has to be on the same level as the chief medical officer with the same rights and the same responsibilities and the same influence over healthcare policy, not just nursing, healthcare policy. So I think that's very important. I think that we too have to um, learn how to have leadership courses that are integrated. And uh, we have been doing um, a, a global leadership policy course um, where we're getting um, nurses from around the world to come together. And they have made inroads in where they um, lead in their own countries going back. We're going to build on that in relation to perhaps a little higher level in relation to politics and politicians in nursing. I think that's the way we have to go. I think that we have to get out of our um, silos. And I, I'll, I'll just give you a very quick story from my own point of view. And it was when I was doing a master's program. I wasn't doing it in, in nursing. I was doing it in um, policy, really, uh, health sector analysis, it was. And I was doing it with other people from government. There were government employees, really. And I had come from hospital. I thought everything revolved around hospital. I thought everything revolved about the patient and everything else. My colleagues were not remotely interested in anything to do with nursing, medicine, policy. All they were interested in was what committee could they get on to move up the ladder? What committee could they get on to influence other people? And what papers would they read that was of most relevance in relation to what they were doing? Newspapers. It wasn't the ordinary newspaper. They wanted to get the newspaper that gave us the most information. I learned a lot from that master's program and it wasn't at the program, it was from my colleagues on the program. So I think that we, we tend to be kind of narrow in nursing in relation to our education. I think we have to branch out and go into other areas learn from other people, be involved with other people and that. And, and you learn, I, when I was on the NCD commission, I learned from all the colleagues around the table. And what I'd learned um, very clearly was that although it's not that they won't support you, it's that they're coming from a different angle and they just don't understand where you're coming from, unless you have 
um, a story with them or unless you explain to them or unless you have some conversations with them. You know, so I think we assume that people know, but they don't. Yeah. So I see we're at time. I'm going to give you just one very, very short last second for each of you to say, what is the one thing walking away from this conversation that we've had and all of the amazing insights around the importance of nurses being able to be at the leadership table, sharing their experiences, their gendered experience and their nursing experiences to improve healthcare and to make the right to decisions to support nurses. What is the one action world leaders have to take to support nurses in the moment? Uh, so let's start. Uh, uh, Sarah, can you give us your, your quick thought on that? That there's investment in us, that you're valuing us as a profession, that you're valuing us as individuals, and that you're investing within our profession and within us, and you're looking at us as leaders, and you're really bringing us into that in an application rather than a theory perspective. Great. Rose? Equal partnership, um, just, you know, building on what Sarah said, treating nurses and midwives as equal partners uh, in the strategic agenda to move health systems forward. Uh, a great deal of midwives should not be a scheduled reminder. You know, they are not a pause. Um, it's not something we celebrate once a year or when we have a pandemic, they should be at the table all the time. Excellent. And last word, Annette. Um, I would like them very much to turn the rhetoric of praise and uh, everything that they have said and thanks to us into action. I think rhetoric means nothing to me. Action means something to me. So they either recognize us as equals at a table and they either invest in nursing and they see us as the backbone if they want a health service and a strong health service. Excellent. Thank you all so much for joining us today and sharing all of your deep insights on this critical issues of elevating the voices of nurses to the leadership table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ami. Thank you very much. Thanks, Annette. Thanks, Thank Sarah. You.